So Sar Sa Sarit and Vitaly, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We hope you had a good break and that you now have new energies for our session. In this talk, we'll explore our journey into detecting botnets. We'll start by taking you down the rabbit hole into one exotic botnet, from the initial uh, discovery till takedown, and then we'll explore and share some detection techniques and mitigations in order to apply in your house. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Sarit, and I'm a security researcher at Imperva for the last 11 years. I mainly focus on web application security, and I develop algorithms to detect and protect against attacks. Hi, everyone. My name is Vitali. I am a security research manager at Imperva. I am mainly interested in application and data security, love teaching and play CTFs, and we are located in Israel. We'll start with, with our research and its goals. So when we stumble across an operation that looks like a botnet, we usually want to answer three main questions. How the botnet operates, what is the purpose of the botnet, and when it all started. Of course, we're also interested in understanding how to de detect and stop the botnet, and we will elaborate on that later on. Now, our research started as part of a trend study that um, in application security that we uh, periodically do. We observed around 9 million attack attempts exploiting PHP unit remote code execution. And we were wondering why is the CV so popular among attackers? To understand this hype, we started to analyze data from our data lake. We saw different IPs using the same payload over and over again, attacking different customers, which remind us of botnet behavior. So we decided to dive in. But first, for, for those who aren't familiar with PHP unit, so PHP unit is a widely used testing framework for PHP. It is used to perform unit tests in the application development cycle. It is used in a variety of uh, content management systems like WordPress, PrestaShop, Drupal, etc., and also in many modules uh, developed by third parties. In 2017, a new uh, vulnerability, remote code execution in PHP, was discovered and released. And the botnet that we're about to talk about is using this uh, vulnerability in order to spread. Now, this is why the effect of such a vulnerability can be quite wide, uh, similar to the log for shell and the spring for shell uh, that we recently witnessed. Uh, let's see how the botnet operates. So we started with the initial uh, request that we saw in our data. And here is a post request to the eval STD in, uh, which is uh, uh, located under the PHP uh, folder in the victim's server. Now, the post body contains a PHP code that downloads a Perl script and executes it. Then it deletes it and also deletes the terminal history to remove traces. The next step we took was to download the Perl script. Now, we can see that the attacker defines a parameter that represents a current up task. This task is scheduled to run every five minutes, uh, and it includes several imports and basic C4 encoding to obfuscate his malicious payload. Now, the output of this task will be sent to DevNull, so no logs will be saved. Uh, one interesting thing to note here is that the attacker was using the combination of Perl and Python, which are both installed out of the box in many Linux systems. And this, uh, increase, uh, this increased the probability of a successful infection. Now, the next step uh, we took is, of course, understanding what this base64 encoded string is all about, what is this Python script, and uh, this, uh, this uh, Python script is actually doing. So here is the decoded code. We can see that um, to stay undetected, the script creates a unique and a deep path under the temp folder. Uh, it creates several uh, hidden folders inside. Uh, then he downloads a CSS file, which is actually a zip file containing a script called updatePy. This is the structure of the, the zip file. There is a lib directory that includes several libraries in Python that the, um, the Python script needs in order to run successfully without external dependencies. Now, in addition, there is uh, the Python module uh, py, 
uh, a custom, custom one that the attacker was using as part of this uh, communication. Now, from now on, we'll call the location of the update py script as repository A. Now, let's see what update py is doing. So, here is a partial screenshot of the code of the update py script, which sends HTTP request to repository BSD. Now, to understand what the purpose of uh, update py, we mimic the request. And you can see here that the um, user agent hit as a special um, phrase Archer Ghost 8, and without it, uh, no response uh, will be received. Now, as a response to a request, a good request with this header, uh, the victim, uh, and in this case it was us, will get the following JSON. And this JSON contains three keys. The first one, the script, uh, contains commands to download uh, and execute a Python script. The next one, the payload, contains a list of sites. And the last one, argv, contains the IP or host name. Now, at this point, um, we didn't fully understand what the purpose of this JSON file, but we just could assume that the victim is using it in order to infect new uh, and attack new victims. Now, after we analyzed the update py script, the custom Python model, and performed several requests, we came to the conclusion that repository BSD must be the CNC. Now, notice, uh, and this is the login screen of the CNC. Now, don't notice this uh, phrase, Adelia Putri. Uh, we saw it earlier in the, um, uh, in the downloader zip. Uh, it was used as a password to extract the, um, the files inside, and we'll talk about it later on in the presentation. Now, I know that we saw a lot of code, so I just want to make sure that you are all with me. Uh, so let's recap. So we had a victim that is being exploited by using PHP unit remote code execution. Then um, the victim downloads uh, the tra Traber PL script, which creates a cron job that is scheduled to run every five minutes to download the downloader zip. This zip contains the update py script, which communicates with the CNC to receive JSON files, and let's call them attack instructions. Now moving on to Vitaly to talk about the attack instructions. Thank you, Sarvid. So uh, after we saw it, we automated the process and fetched as much attack instruction uh, as possible. Uh, after that, we parsed them and found out that there are multiple CSS files, which are what we showed are actually zip files. Uh, from now on, I will call the location of the CSS files as repository B. So here is an example of one of the repositories. Uh, it's a legitimate site uh, that was classified as an educational uh, website. It's located in Indonesia. As you can see, uh, it stores many bundles. So we are calling those CSS files uh, bundles. Um, it's located under the CSS path with other legitimate uh, CSS files. And they all have the same prefix, which is the in-memory. Um, and then we mentioned there are zip files. We discovered more than uh, 70 uh, repositories, which are basically all hacked websites. Now let's look at one of the bundles. Um, so we chose uh, the vBulletin bundle. If you're not familiar, vBulletin is a framework for forums that is written in PHP. Uh, it contains four main parts. Uh, so the lib folder, we already saw it in the downloader zip. Um, and uh, from now on, we'll show you a, a lot of code snippets. Uh, we don't expect you to, to read it. They are here for reference for what we found. Okay, so um, the initial script will run uh, from a VBPy. Uh, VBPy is present in the attack instructions, in one of uh, the attack instructions. Um, it receives two arguments. The first one is a file with the list of domains to attack, and the second one is the IP or the host, main, host name that those sites are uh, hosted on. Um, for, each, uh, um, uh, for each domain, a new executor will run. This executor is, contains all von many vulnerabilities that are related to uh, the vBulletin. Um, for each URL, uh, vulnerable URL, and for each domain, 
a new exploit with a payload will run. So it's created like a tree. Um, inside the exploit folder, we can find the, the payload, uh, the logic to check for successful exploitation, and the reporting back to the CNC. So this is how the reporting looks like. Uh, on a successful exploitation, a, a post request with a JSON body will be sent. The JSON body will contain the module, uh, the bundle that was used in the exploitation, and the domain that was infected. Um, so what about the payloads? So almost all payloads for the uh, uh, bundles contain uh, the, same, the same payload. It's basically a, a PHP script that will allow further upload of additional files. However, we also discovered a different bundle um, that its purpose is to brute force WordPress login sites. And we suspect that this module was used to uh, enrich uh, the repository bees that we uh, seen before. Um, Totally, we uh, found 17 bundles, so each bundle will target a different framework that is written in PHP, um, and most of them will exploit vulnerabilities that are related to remote code execution, file upload, and remote file inclusion. And two main payloads that basically lead to persistency uh, on the victims. So after a successful exploitation, uh, the bot master can connect and uh, expand its activity. And now back to Sari to talk about the purpose. Okay, so now at this point we're wondering why, what, is, uh, the, what are the initial uh, actions the bot master will do with just nearly infected victims? And what is the main purpose of the botnet? So in order to understand what the purpose of the, vi of the victims, we had to become a victim ourselves. So we created a CMS honeypot with a vulnerable plugin and attacked it with a fake bot. Then we reported to the CNC of a successful infection. And by that, our honeypot became a bot uh, in the botnet waiting for the botnet master to approach and change its purpose. Now, it took the attacker one and a half hours to connect our honeypot, uh, which is kind of impressive as it was very quickly. Now, I want to add here that the honeypot that, were, that we created uh, was in a dockerized environment, and we had some sort of log inside, and we could see what the attacker was doing there, like uh, which files he added or modified, and which uh, commands he ran inside. So we saw that the attacker was adding uh, a second web shell with uh, command execution capabilities. Now, after, after that, he ran several commands and escalated his privileges, and by that he got complete control over the server. Now, we saw four purposes for the bots. The first one was a result of our CMS honeypot, which was converted into a clickbait site. When we tried to access the honeypot login screen, we were redirected to one of many clickbait sites. Now, an exciting purpose we observed was a crypto miner that mines for Monero coins. As part of the code analysis we did, we got access to the hacker's payment address and we could see his balance in real time. Now the other two purposes are related to the mission of the newly bots that were added to the botnet and let me elaborate on that. So if you all remember, the initial attack that started this whole research is a payload related to PHP unit. Now once a victim server was attacked, it was added to the botnet as a spreading bot. And why do I call it a spreading bot? This is because this bot constantly communicated with the CNC to receive attack instructions, telling him who to attack and how. Um, the bot is used to infect new machines and expand the botnet. Now, a victim that was infected by the spreading bot can become one of two, a spreading bot himself or a pending bot. So let's talk about the pending bot. So a pending bot, as I just said, is a victim site that was attacked by a spreading bot, and now sits in idle, waiting for the bot ma botnet master to approach and change its purpose. And this is why we, we named it pending bot. It just sits and wait. It doesn't initiate communication with the CNC. Now, I just want to add that we said that uh, the pills that are being used, um, the attacker has 
remote code execution on the servers, and also file uploads. So basically, he can do whatever he wants. We saw those purposes. Now, until now, we covered the full flow from the initial infection of a victim to become a bot in the botnet to the time where it infects other victims per demand by the CNC. Now, let's see the entities that play a role in this massive operation. So, when looking at the botnet entities, we can split them into three groups. The botnet infrastructure, the botnet third-party services, and the botnet actors. Added under the botnet infrastructure, we have the CNC, which is responsible for the entire operation and is used to supply attack instructions to other bots. We have repository A, which stores the update py script, and we have repository B, which stores the bundles, the CSS files. Um, I just want to add that repository A and B are, um, uh, are uh, legitimate sites that were hacked and are used by the botnet master. Now, under the third-party services, we have GitHub and Pastebin that the attacker was using as part of the infection. Um, there were several um, files there, among them uh, payloads, for example, the uh, file upload and uh, the crypto miner. And last, we have the botnet actors, we have the victim, and we have the pending bot, with, which is a bot that sits and wait to, uh, for the botnet master to approach and change its purpose. And we have the spreading one, which um, ask for, uh, has a com constant communication with the CNC to receive attack instructions. Okay, so until now we covered two questions. What, uh, how, the op how the botnet operates, and what is the purpose of the botnet? Now let's continue and talk about when it all started. So we named the botnet Kashmir Black. And why is this the selected name? So during the code analysis we did, we bumped into a GitHub repository called Kashmir Black. And it um, included several files, and among them the, um, the, the crypto miner and the web shell. And also, during the code analysis we did, we saw many times this phrase, and here is an example of one of them. Now let's go and talk about the activity timeline of the botnet. So we said that the first time that we noticed the botnet activity was, during a, was a result of a trend study that we periodically do. And this happened on January 2020. Then we checked our data lake. And so, request back from November 2019. After the code analysis we did, we saw several comments inside, and we saw that it was uh, from May 2016. Now, on October 2020, we released two blogs related to the botnet operation, and we also um, approached uh, the law enforcement and the site owners of all, all the repositories uh, and told them about the malicious activity that the sites have been doing. Now, the last evidence that we saw of the botnet of updating uh, was in one of the repositories. We saw the modification date of the bundles from June 2021. Now, you're probably wondering what is the current state of this, uh, of this botnet. So, as we can see, the botnet operation uh, was for about five years, and after we reported the site owners and the law enforcement, we checked our data and we couldn't see additional requests uh, on our customers, but we believe that it doesn't mean that the operation stopped completely. Now back to you, Vitaly. Thanks. Uh, okay, so now we'll talk about the Kashmir Black evolution. Uh, we had the research data for about one year and this is the first uh, uh, phase of, of the botnet, and I will just recap how it operates. So we have the PHP remote code execution uh, being exploited uh, on a victim. Then the victim downloads Trouble PL script uh, from the CNC. Um, after that, it will approach repository A, which contains the update PY, uh, and it will run every five minutes to fetch attack instructions from the CNC. Once the attack instruction uh, is received uh, from one of the repository Bs, uh, the victim will attack uh, new victims. So this is the initial stage. At this stage, if you can see, we have only one bundle in memory.css, 
And this bundle contains all the exploit for uh, uh, the entire uh, framework for PHP. Now, the second phase, uh, we called it spreading the bundles. Uh, in this stage, the attacker introduced many more repository bees. It gave him agility. Um, and now he also um, split up the in-memory CSS bundles. So instead of having one single CSS uh, bundle, uh, he will have multiple in-memory CSS. Each one of them will target a different PHP framework. So as you can see, uh, now he has a, a, an infrastructure like plug and play. He can find more vulnerabilities, just create a, a CSS, replicate it across uh, his repositories, and uh, uh, respond with a new attack instruction. Now, the third step is load balancing and hiding the CNC. So in this stage, he introduced a new hacked uh, uh, web server which will hold uh, the trouble PL. So now the victim will not approach uh, the CNC, but he will approach the hacked uh, website. He moved the update PY uh, to one of the repositories. So now repository A and B uh, are joined into one. Uh, um, and because they joined as one, he needed to add a load balancer. So on each, so when he wants to pull the update PY, which is the communication script, he need to uh, let the victim know where it's located. Another thing, uh, here he reduced the time of the cron job from five minutes to three. And uh, he, to cut all communication with the CNC, he introduced uh, another server, we called it instruction server. So as the name implies, it only uh, fetches instru instructions and reports back. And at this point, uh, you can see uh, the victim never directly talks to the CNC. Now, the last step that we observed was adding Dropbox. So instead of the uh, instructions server, he replaced it with Dropbox uh, for uh, getting the attack instructions and reporting on successful exploitation. So this is a big change. It's uh, completely... Um, uh, masks the communication, so I think everybody here using Dropbox and organization also, so uh, you will not be suspicious of, of any activity. Uh, now let's dive into Dropbox, so it was an interesting one. So because we had the code for all the bundles and we can uh, uh, track, we found uh, this uh, request to fetch attack instructions, and as you can see, uh, we got the authorization key to access at the Dropbox account. So we thought to ourselves, why not poke around and see uh, what we can find? So uh, here we could find a root directory called Adelia P. So if you remember, we already see Adelia uh, P in multiple places. It was the password for the zip file. It was in a couple of URLs. And you might be wondering uh, what, what, does it, what it means, Adelia P. So the full name is Adelia Putri. Putri in Indonesian is princess. So after we analyzed the code and the request, we came to the conclusion that this is a, an Indonesian hacking group, uh, and its name is Phantom Ghost. And um, inside the root directory, uh, we had another directory called payloads. It contained more 400,000 attack instructions. Another folder is the loot folder. Uh, inside the loot folder, we had a sub-directory called NoSQL. NoSQL was the last bundle that we saw that the attacker used. This bundle contained multiple uh, exploits for SQL and NoSQL uh, databases to deliver the payload. Inside, we found only one report of successful exploitation. And we think uh, the attacker was in the middle of uh, transitioning and testing uh, this option of using Dropbox as the attack instruction. Um, now let's see the communication changes uh, that happened uh, following the infrastructure changes. So this was the first request to repository BSD, which is the CNC. Uh, the second step was added, uh, as we believe, after we created our honeypot. So uh, maybe the attacker was suspicious of our request. And now he added two new headers uh, uh, to report back to the CNC. 
The first one is the IP header, and the second one is the country. So we suspect that it's a security mechanism that uh, the hacker are used so that only infected bots uh, can, can talk to the CNC. Um, the next change was uh, removing connections uh, entirely uh, to the CNC. So now we have a third uh, um, attack instruction uh, server. And the last one is the Dropbox. So here you can see the request to fetch attack instructions that are inside uh, the TXT file. Uh, another change, uh, we don't know what, what, why he, he chose to do it, but is to add an, a notification. So basically, um, after he uploaded the, the PHP file, um, he also tried to deface some of the, uh, of the servers. And on a successful defacement, uh, uh, he sent back a notification uh, to the CNC. Now, at this point, uh, we tried to estimate uh, the size uh, of, the, of Kashmir Black. Uh, we believe it has exponential uh, growth. Um, so I will start with some numbers. Um, so we observed 285 bots attacking our customers, and I will round, round a of course, it's only portion of the traffic because we don't see the whole traffic of the botnet. And I will round this to 300 just to make calculation easier. So we know that uh, every bot will co uh, communicate with the CNC every three minutes. So each bot will carry out 480 attacks per day. So 300 bots uh, will uh, generate uh, 140,000 attacks per day. So if only half percent of them are successful, in the next day we will have 1,000 new bots. By day seven, we can have one million bots. So of course it's only a theory because in reality we have limited uh, number of targets and the exponential growth uh, will stop at some point. Back to you, Sarit, to talk about detection and mitigations. Okay, so until now you saw the analysis of the Kashmir Black botnet. And as you all know, in the last couple of months, uh, we saw two new high and uh, new profile vulnerabilities related to the log for shell and spring for shell uh, that the attackers are using now to create new botnets. And we started to analyze them. And we would like to share with you some detection and mitigation techniques that you can uh, apply at your house. So uh, I just want to, to show some uh, six bullets that you, that you need to, that you should apply, and I will uh, elaborate on them later in the, in the next slide. So we have the patch management, file extension, cron jobs, reduce attack surface, temp directory, and third party services. Let's start with the first time. Uh, so patch management. Uh, attackers are using known CVEs to create botnets. Uh, basically, it's very easy to take um, a POC out there that uh, just published, take it, use it, and uh, use it uh, to automate uh, the exploitation phase. Now you have two options here. The first one is uh, update your software, uh, the vulnerable uh, uh, framework that you are using, uh, and patch it. But as we all know, it's, uh, sometimes it's very hard to find and locate all, all these uh, frameworks and applications, like in the log for shell and uh, that, um, that was recently uh, happened. Uh, and sometimes even the server is in production phase and you cannot just patch it now. You need to schedule it and talk to the developers. So you have another, um, another way to, to, to tackle this one and you can uh, do virtual patching. For example, deploy a WAF uh, to block specific user agents or something like that. Next, we have file extensions. Um, hackers camouflage the files uh, with legitimate extensions. Like we saw in the Kashmir Black, um, the hacker was using the .css instead of uh, the zip file. Uh, and we also saw yesterday uh, some bot that was using the .gif instead to, to hide his uh, DLL file. Now you can run a simple Python script to, uh, to detect such anom anomalies. Just check what is the extension of the file and then uh, run the file command to see uh, what this is really about. And we wrote some uh, uh, such a script. If you uh, want, we can share it with you. Uh, next is cron jobs. 
So cron jobs are very popular among system administrator to automate tasks. And hackers uh, use them to, to automate their uh, deployment and the communication of the operation. Now, um, and also to uh, make sure that their, their infection will continue and run over and over again in, in case the victim server uh, booted or restarted. Now, it's funny, but you can create a cron job to check your cron jobs uh, and see if there is a cron that was using something uh, fishy, for example, uh, some uh, base64 encoded functions. And you can also add to this uh, the same cron and the file mismatch script from uh, the previous uh, slide. Just um, uh, run them together and send you a, a notification uh, or a Slack or email or something like that uh, uh, that will run over and over again on your uh, server, server uh, to see if someone took over it. Next is reduce attack surface. So hackers love using lolbins, which are leave of the land binaries. Those are software that are present in the server like Python, uh, Perl, Git, um, uh, wget, something like that, that the hackers are using to enable their operation. Now, we recommend to remove them completely impossible. But if it's not possible, you should create a dedicated user that will use those specific um, binaries. And this will definitely uh, reduce the possibility of an attack. Now, the temp directory. Hackers love the temp directory. You should monitor it. The temp directory is one of the folders that has execution permissions for everyone. And hackers use it to hide their scripts, uh, to hide additional files, like we saw even also yesterday, if you, if you remember. Uh, this is a, a great folder to use. So you should monitor it. And you can use uh, Python with the watchdog package uh, to run and track changes. And you can also add it to the cron job from before. And the last one, third-party services. So the botnet that we saw, both Kashmir Black and the one for log for shell and spring for shell, using common services to carry out their operation. Now, if your server doesn't initiate communication with Robox, Discord, GitHub, and etc., you should just block the egress traffic for those services from your server. Uh, by using, for example, firewalls. Thank you very much for listening to our talk. Uh, feel free to contact us if you have any additional uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Vitaly's sleeping. I was sorting out. Come on, guys. Yeah. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any idea uh, how the botnet is distributed geographically? What, what? Uh, like the geo-distribution geo of the botnet. Yeah, actually, uh, as part of the uh, milking, like we took all the attack instructions, we go over the, um, the location of the victims and we saw that they're spread over uh, uh, 30 countries, but mainly focused in the US. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. Don't be, don't be afraid. They don't bite. <laughs> there. So, did you do any further work on the attribution side? Because I think there is some kind of like Instagram account linked to the Tadelia Putri stuff, or or maybe it's just some kind of false flag. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no, so so we haven't. Uh, but if you, when we found like the the scripts inside, if you look, for example, at Google at Phantom Ghost, so it's a known uh, crew in Indonesia. 
that, uh, that is performing some attacks, uh, but we didn't do any further research there. Um, when you did your estimation for the exponential spread of the malware, uh, did you have any basis for the number, the 0.5% chance of spreading, or is it like uh, pulled out of nowhere? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, an hypothesis because we only can see um, the traffic for our customers, and of course, as a security company, we blocked most of the uh, all of the attacks, uh, so it just was a hypothesis. Hi, um, did you manage to find a way to fingerprint uh, compromised servers that were sleeping so that you could scan the internet and figure out exactly the botnet size and who the victims are? Um, so we did it for um, the repositories, which are also Hux website, because you can like browse to the CSS and find the in-memory prefix. Uh, some of the repositories are still alive um, but we didn't find, I mean, we don't have any access to, to the attack uh, domains. Um, question regarding the, the package itself, I can understand that uh, um, basically it, it can be reused by other attackers if they discover. Do you see it being propagated and used by other criminals? Um, that's maybe the first part of the question. The second is, have you seen any similar offering on the underground forums, maybe offering this as a solution, as a tool, or maybe as a service as well, um, in, the, in the package um, that is being sold? Yeah, so, as we mentioned, uh, the mesh per spreading was the use, the exploitation of PHP units from code execution. So, we did see for the past several months, again, some threat actor leveraging that, because for some reason, developers does not patch that, because it's a testing framework, so, they don't think it can be exposed. And we haven't seen like the use of these bundles that we saw, so only by this actor. And the second question was? <laughs> ah, hacking forms. Uh, no, no we haven't, so. Okay, no more questions. One, two, three. Okay, thank you.